Well, this is obviously a work in progress. So, um, again, this is uh, March the 26th, I believe. March the 26th. Um, and this is our daily uh, Bible study. Um, just as a little side note, but uh, today is uh, Brother Nathan and Miss Jen's anniversary. Uh, so they get a, while well, I had a coronavirus birthday, they get a coronavirus anniversary. Um, so very interesting how that works. But if you get a chance, you might want to send them a, a uh, anniversary congr congrats by phone or Facebook or something like that. So, all right. Um, so uh, we are here live. I'm going to give just a couple minutes because some people like to watch live. So I'm going to give just a couple minutes for people to get caught up. We're working on uh, Brother Nathan and I are becoming um, uh, more adept at uh, production, trying to figure out how to uh, how to do all this in a manner that is more uh, um, enjoyable to watch. So uh, here we are. So again, I'll give just a few more minutes. And again, of course, uh, the governor here in the state of Idaho has now given a 21-day stay-at-home uh, declaration. It's not made it an absolute order, and I appreciate that to some extent. I know it may, it may be necessary in time to come because of the way some people uh, just don't listen or don't believe and don't, have, uh, don't follow uh, what's instructed. Um, so I would encourage you, whether you think it's a big deal or not, just at this point do what he asks. Romans, Romans 13 is pretty clear uh, that we are to obey those that have the governorship over us because uh, they care for our souls. And I do believe that the decisions around this are in purpose for caring for souls. And again, I understand, and it's more of a, it's more of a, um, every, the way everybody responds is to how you're personally affected. Uh, I've had some I've seen that have made comments like all these people you know, all our grandparents survived all the horrible things that happened to them, you know, all the various flus and pandemics and wars. And we talked about that a little bit in the last couple of days. But at the same time, there were a lot of people that did die in those flus and pandemics and wars and their families were affected. And so I would encourage you to avoid a avoid a um, extremity response. Try to be thoughtful that um, if it was your family that's being affected and we have church, we have members in our church that. Um, according to what we know about coronavirus, would be more susceptible um, to having it, and not just having it, but um, it causing some severe issues in their life. So, um, so don't be aware of those that are just sco complete scoffing at it, and then be aware of fear, as we've talked about in the last. Brother Nathan talked about worry yesterday. I tried to talk about the fear side of it, um, you know, a couple of days ago, and you know that you know, that terror. Uh, so again, um, try to be aware and be careful of that. I think we are probably close to uh, where we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we will be doing live stream services Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Uh, I will announce those times on Facebook uh, between Brother Nathan and I. I have sent Miss Naomi home. Um, I am at home to give Brother Nathan the freedom to be at church. I may also be at church occasionally. You can call the church, leave messages. We will be checking our messages, <clears throat> and we are doing our best to still maintain some semblance of office presence, even if that's from the house. I'm studying from the house, and Brother Nathan is getting some work done there at the church. We're trying to push as far as we can, do as much as we can with what we have. These are strange times. Many people are stuck at home. Many people are not. Uh, we are blessed, many of our men, I say blessed, maybe, maybe not. Many of our men uh, here at church have jobs that are still considered necessary for the functioning of our, our city and our area. And so their jobs are being maintained. But that's not true for everyone. And we do have some of our older folks who have been stuck at home now already for more than a week and are going to look at another three weeks on top of that, as you do in your communities if you're not from our community. I would encourage you to check on them, be a help to them, call uh, call them definitely and uh, just talk just spend some time talking people need to have communication with people we've done far enough so i am going to since no one else asked the question uh i brother nathan and i encourage 
some questions. So when we do our devos, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, some of you text or ask privately, that's fine, but most likely the question you have, other people have as well. So don't be afraid to include those in the comments. Include questions, thoughts. We may be able to answer it on the spot. We may just take it and say, I'll look at that and I'll get back with you. So I had a question for me from my uh, live stream Bible study on Tuesday on terror, not functioning out of terror. As I thought through, I was reminded myself of the verse in 2 Corinthians 5.11. 2 Corinthians 5.11 that says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So I had to go and ask myself my own question. And if some of you thought of that, you should have put it on Facebook or called me or something. And uh, But anyways, we went and looked back at it. <clears throat> it's interesting, the context of 2 Corinthians um, and this particular word, and we'll look at both of those. So in 2 Corinthians, Paul was doing a little bit of that weird case of trying to encourage the Corinthians from the first book that he had written and also in the position of having to defend himself, which nobody likes to do. If you're a thinking person, you don't like to have to defend yourself because as many of us know, if you start defending yourself, uh, people automatically say, me thinks you doth protest too much. Why are you defending yourself? But at the same time, uh, if we were to challenge a police officer, why he stopped us, we put him in a position of having to defend himself or prove who he is, that he has the right to do so. And that's what had happened to Paul. So a lot of the verbiage, a lot of the words that Paul uses throughout the book are self-defense comments, which he probably preferred not using. And he uses the word we a lot, which could be a reference not just to himself, but to other apostles, and also because much of what he's defending are things that believers ought to be doing as a whole. So the we can apply to himself and to believers. So... In this passage, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul has been defending himself several times. If you, you can go back uh, and look through the various uh, first four chapters, and he already begins to do some of that, um, some of that self-defense, if you will. Uh, and, of course, in the beginning of this chapter... He talks about, uh, you know, if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. And, of course, 2 Corinthians, Paul's not too far at this point from his own martyrdom. And uh, he's a very serious, close thing that he's saying, listen, it might not be too long. I, this tabernacle might be dissolved. And it's really even interesting, just the words, look up words. It's a lot of fun. Because even this word, we know that if the earthly house, our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, uh, the tabernacle was a tent. The word dissolved is almost can almost be the same idea as striking a tent. In their idea, it was a word that could have been used for either or, striking a tent um, or, or dis, you know, dissolved, destroyed. Uh, just really cool how that works. But uh, he, in other words, he's comparing his own life here, not as a permanent thing. It's just a tent. Um, and he said, you know what? I've got a very important life. I'm an apostle, but this is just a tent. And one day I'm going to strike this tent or God's going to strike this tent and I'm going to be in my permanent home. And he says, that's why he compares it in verse one, tabernacle to a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's just cool stuff. So pay attention to things like that. But so here's Paul and he says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon. Uh, he does want to go to heaven, but he knows that to stay here is necessary uh, for uh, for these, you know, for us left over, for the Corinthians and who he's writing the book. And he talks about that God's the one that worked worked that in us in verse 5. And, of course, you know, verse 6, uh, if we're not here, we're at, which is true for him and for us, we're not here, we're with the Lord. And he says in verse 9, he says, that's why I labor. This is why I'm laboring and why we should labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Because this isn't where we're living this isn't our permanent home. Our permanent home is going to be in heaven. And uh, so we ought to be working in regard to what's coming in heaven, not to what we have here. So you hear some of that, I I'm doing what I'm doing because this is not our permanent place. We all have to, we all have an afterlife. You know, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to face God. That's why, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. 
And then he says in verse 10, you know, here again, talking about the afterlife, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now that's very good context to put it in here. So who appears at the judgment seat of Christ? Not the lost. That's the great white throne judgment. He's referring to the judgment seat of Christ is where believers are judged. And of course, if we go look through the rest of the book of First and Second Corinthians, we find out that the purpose for the judgment seat of Christ is to for, and he says here that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And we know from other writings of Paul that the bad will just be burnt up. There's no, there's no um, judgment per se there, but there's nothing to receive from bad works. There's nothing there to receive. It gets burnt up. Okay, it just disappears. So the bad to, to receive there, you know, we're going to receive what? A loss is what we're going to receive, a loss of all the stuff that's just burnt up. And then God's looking for those precious jewels, the good motive uh, works that are there. So he says, listen, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, because there is a judgment seat, you know, and, and uh, one day I'm going to stand before God, and God is going to look at what I've done. And can we just pause a sec? The very next thing he says is knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm concerned about what God uh, thinks of my works. And it is a little scary to think about. It, it's not scary as in I am utterly terrified, but it is a, sometimes we would use the word mortified in our day and age now. Uh, it It is a scary thing to think about. And, you know, I... To think about that feeling of standing before God and him judging our works and finding out that a lot of what we've done, and we already know a lot of what we've done, is just going to go poof. Now, that's a scary thing, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Hey, you know, I and I hope you would have some sense of that also, you know, that one day we're going to stand before God. It's like, if I could put it this way, I've used that before, where dad, my dad has left a list of, of chores to do. Uh, during the summer and he goes to work and I've got this list and then um, I mess around and don't work on the list and then as I'm messing around I see dad's car pull in the driveway and I'm reminded I didn't do my list and you know what that feels like that scary that scary feeling that's that's the kind of thing that uh, that Paul is talking about here and it's interesting because the word terror here is one of those words that can be used as a mix. It can be used either or. It can be used for terror or for awe or reverence. And we have that same thing. Again, I reference the word that we now use that, not a definitive, but we use, I would be mortified, you know, um, if something like that happened. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. And then he adds this couple of statements. We persuade men. Now, again, in context here, he's not talking about the, the great white throne. So it leaves us a little bit of question, what, what what is he persuading men of and which men is he persuading? Because he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's not done. He says, but we are made manifest unto God. He said, I'm having to defend myself before men. I don't have to defend myself before God. God knows who I am. Okay, what's he been doing in the book of Second Corinthians? He's been defending himself against accusations that he's trying to use his power or his his uh, personal presence to just get people to do what he thinks is right. No, Paul is saying, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to get people people understand that there's a judgment seat of Christ coming. You know that that we as believers do have to answer for some things, and you know, I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing because I am going to stand before God, and I want to do what God wants. He says, listen. God knows who I am. I made manifest unto God. Then he says in the rest of the verse, and uh, verse 11, first, 2 Corinthians 5, 11, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. He says, now your conscience should tell you, how did I act before you when I was there? How did I treat you? How have I treated you? He said, you should know. You of all people, Corinthians, should know who I am. He said, but for the rest of these people, I guess I'll have to persuade men. So it's highly likely that this persuade men may have nothing to do with persuading men to salvation, but having to persuade men that he has come not because of to to build himself up or to lift himself up, but because he has to answer to God and he is on purpose trying to do what God wants him to do because he has to answer to God also. Um, but let's just say it is 
let's just say for the sake of argument that it that it is talking about persuade men to salvation okay <clears throat> let's i think there's a question as to whether that's true or not so if it's going to talk about persuade men to salvation what's the context in which terror is being used here in verse 11 again knowing therefore the terror of the lord it does not say using therefore the terror of the lord it does not say um terrorizing people because of the lord it says of because of what i know i am going to spend time persuading men persuading what is persuading it's not uh you know cuffing them upside the head and saying you ought to believe this or blah 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 no it's it's spending time listening to what they're saying and then trying to be persuasive using God's word, using proper arguments for proper objections to teach people and help people understand who Jesus is and what the judgment seat of Christ is, what the afterlife is all about. Um, so even at that, it does, it's not forwarding the idea of using terror okay, to persuade men. It's just knowing again that one day I'm going to have to stand before the Lord and answer for this, which, again, ought to, just like me with my dad pulling in the parking lot or pulling in the driveway, make us go, uh-oh, um, listen, we do have to answer to the Lord for what we're doing. We do. Which is interesting because it leads me to my next thought, okay, my next idea, next thought, is we are not able to meet right now as a as a church. And I'm going to acknowledge right now that we're not going to be able to spend enough time to uh, to deal with this this whole topic in a complete manner, but I do want to hit a few high points. <clears throat> We're not able to meet as a church. The primary thing that a church does is assemble. It comes from the very word church. Uh, in the Greek word ekklesia, you called out assembly. It's a group of people meeting in one spot. Uh, literally, the Greek word means a, a an assembly. A, a, and it even refers to the individuals as they meet. It doesn't even refer to those individuals when they go home. They're just average citizens. But when they come and meet, they become the assembly. Really interesting how that's... Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to do some more study on that word and that how that's used. But <clears throat> us as a church, we are not able to assemble because of this uh, COVID-19. And again, this is not an attack on the gospel. It's, uh, it's the... Our government... Maybe an overreaction, maybe not. There's an argument to be made both ways. They are doing it, I believe, out of the concern for safety of the people who would be susceptible um, to not only catching this, but uh, being severely impacted by it through severe disease or death. So when we think about a church, if we can't assemble, uh, what are we as believers to do and how can we still maintain some semblance of church? Well, I think we've answered that somewhat in these daily Bible studies and in our live stream on Sunday. We can't assemble, but we can maintain some of those practices to help keep our heart and mind uh, turned that way. But this is a very good time for us to examine our life as believers. I'll give you a, just as a for instance, one of the things that I've walked through in my own mind. I'm going to encourage you during live stream on Sunday for the live stream services to get up, get up early, do your normal Sunday routine, get dressed for church. Oh, I'm at home. I don't want to get dressed for church. That's only if I go to church. Can, can I ask you a question? Then why don't you, who are we trying to please then? For what purpose are we getting dressed? Why are we dressing up? Because if I'm only getting dressed up because I'm going to be in front of people, then you're missing the point of what the assembly is all about on Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. We're not dressing up to impress each other. And while sometimes we say that, while sometimes we say that, uh, the truth is we only understand that as a fact. I'm not sure if we've really thought through the consequences of that because the same Christian who will say that, well, you know, uh, I'm getting dressed up for the Lord. When they go home, it's still the Lord's day. We're still meeting as a group, but they won't get dressed up. Why not? The whole purpose hasn't changed. Uh, we're still meeting with the Lord. We're still going to sing. We're still going to pray. The only difference is other people are not in attendance. 
So could it be that, truthfully, the reason we're getting dressed up is not for the Lord, it's really because of other people? <laughs> I think it's true. I think it's a fair point. I think we need to take this whole event right now and really look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what is true Christianity? What is what is church? Why am I singing? Don't, listen, if you're not singing at your house when Brother Nathan leads the music here, there's a question. That's a question. If you're not singing when Brother Nathan leads the music at your house, then you're not singing for the Lord. And the only reason you're singing at church is not for the Lord either. It's for other people. This is about the Lord. So I'm going to encourage you on Sunday, um, get up, get dressed. It's for the Lord. It's not for us, not for me. It's for God. How would you want to appear before God? Because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to gather together to worship God. So how would I want it? How would I want to dress if I'm going to meet God? Uh, when it's time to, for the reading of the Bible, stand up. If we're going to honor the reading of the Bible, then stand up. <laughs> I mean, we're honoring the reading of the Bible. We're not honoring other people by showing. That's an appearance. That is an appearance. We want to say, well, God judges the God judges my you know my heart, not my appearance. Right. But the problem is, as humans, in that regard, if I'm standing up at church and not standing up at home, we are revealing our heart and revealing that typically what we're doing it as far as appearance. If I'm getting dressed at church and not at home, then I'm not doing it because of my heart. I'm doing it for appearance. Now, granted, I know that's probably a little black and white, but I'm trying to draw, I'm trying to draw a, a picture here, if you will, you know, trying to draw a connection, help us understand. So, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So here's, here's an interesting thought. Um, but we are made manifest unto God. We are made manifest unto God. God does know who we are. Um, and it's not a wrong thing to defend ourselves in front of people and do, do these some, some, things, some things on purpose. But what is a church? What is a church? It's an assembly. We can't assemble. Uh, but there are some things we can still do. Like I just mentioned some of those things. So <clears throat> what is the primary purpose of the church that should help us um, at least according to the great commission okay so i'm going to go to the great commission so one of my favorite passages for that the simple ones in mark the more um, the more revealing one if you will is in matthew chapter 28 so again still trying to stay in what is a church let's function as a church let's do those things as a church matthew 28 verses 18 through 20 okay the Great Commission, we like to call it. So the 11 disciples are gathered there. If it was just given to those 11 disciples, then the Great Commission doesn't matter anymore because they're dead. If it was given to the 12 apostles, 11 apostles, again, doesn't matter because they're dead. If it was given to just those men as Jews, then we don't have to do it. Only Jews, believing Jews, have to do it. So then who did he give it to? He gave it to this group of believers who were gathered together, who they just spent time numbered, back in the upper room, okay, numbered as a, you know, a membership role, okay, this 11, this, this sounds to me like he's giving it to this church, these men as a church, which would make sense, I am with you all even unto the end of the world, there's your church perpetuity, God's given it to these men as representatives of the church, it says they saw him, verse 17, they worshiped him, of course some doubted, that's church, verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore. Okay, so again, ye is a plural word, wise. Wise in the King James are plural. Y pronouns are plural. And T pronouns are singular. Um, th that's why the King James uses these and thous and yees and yous. And so you is not an individual thing. It's a plural word. Um, again, so verse 19, I'm using again a lot, aren't I? I'm going to have to work on that. Verse 19, go ye therefore, so all of you as a group, each individual in the group, go you, go therefore, you therefore go, and teach. So that's number one, teach all nations. Can we still do that? Is that what we're doing now? <laughs> that's what we're doing right now. That's the purpose of these Bible studies. It's a good thing to encourage uh, other people. I've already got calls from some of our church members who are actively trying to work with their family and try to encourage them. Um, I have had opportunities, again, as I've mentioned before, uh, there was that again, again, uh, Brother Nathan and I both have had opportunities to talk to um, salespeople 
you may have an opportunity to talk to a you know, grocery store attendant or a construction worker or a, a plumber. Those people have to come into our houses, HVAC guys. You still have an opportunity to teach. Now, teach does not mean win. It just means teach, teach, teach people about Jesus. Teach people about God. Teach people what Jesus came for. And listen, teaching implies that I have to understand how that person is learning. Because if I'm going to teach, I have to know that they're understanding what I'm what I'm teaching. That's one of the reasons we're doing these Bible studies, and we want interaction because we want to know: Are you understanding what's being said? Um, is there something that you have a question about? Because if there's a question, there there's probably an answer for it. We may not have it right now, but we'll go get it. That's what teaching is all about. A teacher to teach is going to come up with new inventive ways to be able to get one concept across to many different ideologies. So. Teach. You can still teach. We are still teaching. You can still spend time teaching. That's one thing we can still do. This this whole coronavirus quarantine does not stop us from teaching. So teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. Technically, we could still baptize. I'd probably wait. I mean, personally, I'd probably wait till we could gather the church uh, together. Uh, but technically, we could probably still baptize. Okay, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And again, verse 20, 28, 20 teaching them to observe. So now we're talking to those who are believers to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is a great time to start teaching your kids. What does the Bible say? Mom, why are we getting dressed for church? Hey, we're not going anywhere. Why are we reading the Bible? Why are we watching preacher on the laptop or on the phone? Um, teaching them. This is an opportunity to teach our kids what is important. Why is church important? What is what are we doing these things for? Who are we doing these for? Teach them. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Thank the Lord, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So there's a very good thing we can do right there is, is teach. Continue to teach. Uh, con continue to gather. Um, teach people. This, this does not, and we've got great opportunities right now. We can use video, Facebook, YouTube. There's many opportunities. I happen to know that there are people that have been attending our church right now who are actively using YouTube as a teaching tool uh, for anyone who will listen. I think that's a great thing. I, we very, may very well take these Facebook Live things and also duplicate them to YouTube and some other uh, locations uh, merely to spread the gospel in as many ways as possible. These are great tools to do that with. I have a dear friend, Pastor Marvin McKenzie, um, who started a YouTube uh, daily Bible study like this? Uh, through the process of that, met some preachers in a country that I won't I won't name right now, but a, a very uh, if I remember right, it might not be the best to name that particular country, but it's we'll just say it's generally in the Middle East. Uh, he began to be able to teach those men, and now they're planting a church because of this interaction right here. That that's that is the purpose. Um, it's a great tool for us to use this for to continue the purpose of the teaching of the Great Commission. Great. I hope we can do that. Let me take you to another another passage just real quick. Acts chapter 2. Uh, I'll read it for you. Acts chapter 2. And I know, I know this is more historical, but it is an example. Um, I believe it's a, a good verse for our example. So Acts chapter 2 and verse... Um, <clears throat> Of course, you know the section 40 through 42. Peter preaches, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word. So that's believers. They gladly received his word. They were baptized. And the same day were added unto them. Again, there's a colon there that connects baptism to, to church membership. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 42. And they, who is that? Who is that? Verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There you go. There are some things that are very easy to do right there. We can't do the breaking of bread right now. We're pretty sure that's probably talking about uh, the Lord's Supper, which we're going to have to move because <laughs> we got to have to stay in place and we'll move it uh, when we know for sure where, when all this how all this plays out, we'll announce it to our church for our church membership. But they, number one, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We are making stuff available right here on Facebook, so you can watch 
You can continue steadfastly. You can pick up your, your notes. Um, you can call into the church, order CDs from past messages. Um, uh, you can continue steadfastly in the doctrine of, of the teaching that you've been given. You can read your Bible. <laughs> you can read your Bible. Uh, look at what's being taught. The Apostles' Doctrine, we have it. It's in many, much of the epistles right now for us. So man alive, continue steadfastly, hold to it, um, to the Apostles' Doctrine. Go study, think, learn, pay attention. It says Apostle Doctrine and fellowship. We can still fellowship. We have the tools available to us in this modern day to be able to fellowship. Uh, phone calls, um, FaceTime calls, people need contact. Humans need humans, and this is not a time for us to forget that. Um, I'll just tell you, I, I'm, I used to be in my younger days, I always want to be out and about. Um, I'd want to be in the middle of stuff happening. The older I get, and you know, maybe pastoring has, has contributed some of that, I like coming home, and I like staying home, and just be with my crew, and as long as we got food, as long as, I'll just be honest, as long as you got food, as long as you got, you know, um, games in the game shelf, and as long as you've got uh, movies you can watch, and entertainment things you can do, our family, we can gather in and be great, um, but Christians shouldn't do that. Excuse me, let me adjust that. Christians shouldn't be limited to that. It's a good thing to spend time together with the family right now, absolutely. But Christians also still be ought to be Christians, and that means fellowship. Fellowship, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Um, I can tell you, some of our older members who are living um, by themselves or just as a couple, they are extremely isolated right now. And some of our members who are um, less healthy are extremely isolated. Call them, talk to them. If you have people in your neighborhood, uh, other believers, wherever you are, if you're not from here, man, check up, call, have a lengthy conversation. Just talk about nothingness, fellowship. Talk about the Lord, fellowship. Um, talk about how how God is working through us. So try to help people with their fear. Um, man, just learn to fellowship. It's breaking of bread. We can't do that at the moment. But And then lastly, it says, end in prayers. Uh, and in prayer so it's it's one of the it's one of the things listed in the armor ephesians chapter 6 the armor of a believer prayers this is a very good time to pray i just tell you even from the things that have happened for for me personally in our church so i mean sorry in our family just little things uh, uh, numerous on top of the coronavirus thing and okay there we go sorry many of you know that um our, uh, my dad uh, has terminal cancer, and he's in Michigan, and I'm here. Thank the Lord my sisters are there taking good care of him. Um, I sure wish I could be there, uh, but I can't, uh, and that weighs upon me. And there's other things. My daughter's had to come home from college, and that's frustrating for her, and I understand that last year of college. Uh, and, you know, you're, it's, those of you who've been to college know that last semester is the best semester you work hard, but it's the most fun semester, and uh, you know you can't go anywhere. And uh, <laughs> we, my my car is in the shop getting fixed um, because somebody bumped into Dana the other day, and we've had other things like my computer at work broke down and just uh, you know everything all at once. Um, it's hard to start looking at that and not going, is the Lord trying to get my attention? Could it be the Lord trying to get my attention? Let me ask you this, could the coronavirus be, could God use this to look at his churches and say, I'm trying to get your attention? I think it's a good thing. I think even with some of the things that we've talked about today, it should make us as believers say, is there some things in my Christian life that need to be adjusted, replaced, repaired? Prayer is a big one. Um, prayer over the last year I have discovered as a wonderful not only outlet for a believer but a tool for the believer God wants us to pray it's repeated let's pray Let, let's pray purposefully on purpose teach our kids to pray get down on our knees and pray um, can God use us sure God can use us to get our attention um, 
And I think if you're paying attention as a believer, um, is he trying to get the world's attention? Is he trying to get the United States' attention? Maybe, maybe not. I'm so He can certainly use these things. Uh, and I, for me personally, just for the events that are happening, for me, uh, it's making me pay attention to my own Christian life. So um, this isn't the time to be less of a Christian. And this isn't time to be less of a church member. It's time for us to, on purpose, look at ourselves and say, am I continuing in the Apostles' Doctrine? Why do I go to church? Why do I why do I even bother listening to preaching? Why am I reading? What's the purpose? Why am I even bothering? Um, why get why get dressed up? What's the purpose of dressed up? Why 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 any of these things? Why should I sing hymns? Why should I sing spiritual songs? Why should I listen to Christian music? All those things. Why is that? Well, are you a Christian? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Um and again, we're not trying to do it for appearance. And right now, it's a very good, very good way for us to check. We're not trying to do it for appearance. How, where's my heart? Where is my heart? Uh, truthfully, and uh, it, I think the Lord can use this, and we should, we should, we should be using it ourselves to take a look at our Christian life and just say, "Listen, let's be honest with self for a minute. Why do I go to church? Why do I read my Bible or not? Why do I pray or not? Why do I get dressed up or not?" Because if I'm doing it for God, it shouldn't still be a problem to keep right on doing it. But if I'm doing it for other people, maybe that's why I'm suddenly going, thank God I don't have to do all that stuff. Okay? So let's be careful. Let's be careful to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and prayers and fellowship. Um, appreciate it. Appreciate uh, how this has worked. Uh, it looks like it's something that's been helpful. Uh, we will get better at it. Um, we are looking at even programs and other things we can do to continue it. Uh, yes, Miss Judy, we're, and we're we got to figure out how to get it on YouTube. Also, there's a um, process we have to work through right there to make that happen. So, appreciate everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me at pastor at jerome bbc dot com. Uh, so that's pastor with the ampersand shift two on your keyboard. Um, jeromebbc.com and I'll be, I can get all my emails here uh, those of you who have my number you can text, call, you can Facebook you can send Facebook messages to us um, Brother Nathan and I both can receive uh, the Facebook message or at least post to the Jerome Bible Baptist Church page and um, <clears throat> so keep at it and we're going to keep at it if you have more questions, things you'd like Brother Nathan and I to address in these daily Bible studies, please ask questions uh, please um, disagree with us. Send it on. Uh, like I say, if your faith can't be examined or if your faith can't be questioned, I question your faith. We appreciate all that you all have done for us. Uh, and We appreciate uh, your prayer for each other and your offers of help. We pray that the Lord will keep you safe and fearless and as good Christians, as believing Christians from the heart, showing forth that what's in your heart uh, throughout these days to come. Thank you all very much. May the Lord bless and goodbye.